Okay, thank you very much for uh, organizing this very interesting meeting and for giving me the opportunity to present this work. So I'm, I will be talking about this thing and it is based on a paper we wrote recently uh, with Gabi Safrir. So the way I will present uh, the work will be slightly different or very different from uh, the way we presented it in the paper. And instead of the introduction uh, and the motivation why the question we are going to address is interesting in a big scheme of things, I will start with very small curious observation which is 25 years old and uh, it goes like this. So consider n equal 1 SU3 as QCD. SU3 is very special, okay, it's QCD, but it's special for another reason also. If you take uh, nine flavors, typically you would expect this theory to be IR free. Okay, this theory lives at the edge of the conformal window and f equals uh, to 3n, but for SU3 this theory is very special. And it is special because the baryons and the antibaryons are marginal. Of, are marginal okay? So you can turn on a generic deformation in the superpotential with these baryonic operators. Okay? And it was observed uh, in the original paper, the seminal paper of Lee and Strassler back in 95, I think. This is one of the examples they give for n equal 1 theory with conformal manifold, a non-trivial conformal manifold. And later, Green, Komargotsky, Seiberg, Tachikawa, and Wecht uh, computed the dimension of this manifold and found it to be seven-dimensional. Okay, so this very, very simple uh, gauge theory with single gauge node has a, a seven-dimensional uh, conformal manifold. On general point of this conformal manifold, it, this fact will become important to us later, so on general point of the conformal manifold, the symmetry, uh, the global symmetry of this theory is completely broken. Okay, so this is a cute observation, 25 years old one. So this slide is a slide of John Schwartz from uh, Strings uh, 2018 in of his talk on the uh, 50th anniversary of string theory, and he gave some lessons. So here is uh, lesson number two that he gave, take coincidences seriously. Okay, so this will be one coincidence that we will take seriously. And another reason we will take it seriously is because Zor Komargotsky asked me about it two years ago and I did not have any answer. So what did Zor uh, ask me about this theory? Again, this theory is very special. It is an n equal 1 theory, very simple n equal 1 theory with single gauge node, which has a very interesting non-trivial conformal manifold. If you think about it with n equal 1 supersymmetry, it's very hard to engineer such a thing with a single gauge node. It's not con it doesn't pass the conformal manifold, doesn't pass through free, through free point. So the, uh, the it's important here, I stress, that we pass through zero coupling. Okay, with quiver theories, we can engineer such things, but with single gauge nodes, it's very hard. If you increase supersymmetry, of course, we know of many examples, and F equals 2 and C with N equal 2 supersymmetry is such an example, or N equals 4 is such an example. It, it's, it's somewhere on its conformal manifold, it's n equals 4. Okay. I don't claim that this is the only example. I wrote here rare, I only know of this example, which is not the formation of anything. Maybe there are other examples, but I don't know. Now, typically with higher amounts of supersymmetry, when we have such conformal manifolds, we have some interesting duality groups which act on them. Okay. Again, examples are n equals 4 and uh, and the uh, cousins of this n equals 4. Uh, moreover, uh, this is a very n neat theory. You can think of it as uh, you have uh, nine flavors, nine fundamental f flavors of uh, SU3, so you have 27 chiral fields. 27 is 3 times 3 times 3. It looks like you take two tri-fundamentals of SU3 and glue them together with SU3 gauging. Now, if you have followed this class S uh, business with n equal to supersymmetry, there is a very nice class of theories where you take tri-fundamentals of SU2 and glue them together with an n equals 2 gauging, not n equal 1 gauging. And then you obtain very interesting class of theories with a lot of interesting dualities. So, Zohar has, uh, had asked me like two or three years ago, a couple of times, these two questions. One question, okay, there is this nice theory with the conformal manifold. Uh, is there any duality group 
acting on this uh, conformal manifold. Is there any action of duality, which is interesting there? And second, related to this picture, is there a geometric realization of this theory? Okay. Can we realize this uh, simple theory as compactification starting from higher dimensions and going down to four dimensions? I thought a little bit uh, about these questions before. We discussed this a little bit, but then my reaction was, okay, this is a cute observation, but I don't have a machine which translates cute observations to uh, physical results. But again, this lesson is very important. Uh, take coincidences seriously, and somehow this question stuck in my mind. And uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, somehow I remembered these uh, questions, and suddenly und I understood that in the last couple of years we did develop a machine which uh, translates cute observations to, uh, to physical uh, results, and that's what this talk will be about. We will try to answer these questions posed by Zohar, uh, using the modern uh, technology that we acquired in the last two or three years. So this is uh, lesson number three from John Schwartz, and uh, this will be the main idea of answering uh, Zohar's questions when working on hard problems, explore generalizations with additional parameters. And the additional parameters we will add to our story is to embed this four-dimensional theory into a six-dimensional picture. We will engineer these types of theories uh, with SU3 gauge groups and nine flavors using six dimensions. You did not ask me what the lesson number one is, but I will tell you in the end. Okay. So this will be our plan. So again, we, in the recent years, we have acquired some understanding about, uh, some very algorithmic understanding about engineering four-dimensional theories starting from six dimensions. And we can use this understanding to answer these types of questions. So we will in engineer rather systematically this model, uh, this very, very simple model starting from, from six dimensions. And this uh, engineering, this way of thinking about this theory will apply, will imply a lot of interesting properties of these types of theories, uh, dualities and so on. And these uh, properties will answer the question that we have posed. Okay, so let us start. So I will start first with uh, just very, very brief review of what uh, we learned in the last 10 years or so about relations between six and four dimensions. There are some references here, but it's very incomplete set of references. So if you don't see yourself appearing here, please tell me later. Okay, so what can we do at the moment? So the, the whole business started from this uh, story which is called class S, when uh, you take a 2 comma 0 theory and com compactify it uh, on the Riemann surface down to four dimensions, and you do so preserving n equal to supersymmetry. This is the seminal work of Gaiotto. And in this way, you, we can engineer a lot of uh, known n equal to field theories in four dimensions, practically all of the known theories, and you can engineer a lot of theories which were not considered before. So this was a big classes uh, revolution, which followed by a very, very uh, unappreciated revolution, which uh, broke the symmetry of class S to n equal one. It started with a paper of Benini, Tachikawa, and Wecht, I think it was 2009, and it took three years to generalize uh, this picture by Ba, Bim, Bobef, and Wecht. And uh, in, in this way of uh, engineering for the theory, we start in six dimensions with the same two comma zero theory, but we uh, exploit, explore more general types of compactifications where the, uh, the, where the supersymmetry in four dimensions is only n equal one. And then a natural uh, step was made to start uh, from more general six dimensional theories, not from two comma zero, but from general one comma zero theories. And uh, this gives rise to many, many different uh, four dimensional theories. Now, one important point about these constructions is that you can start from six dimensions, apply certain algorithm and predict existence of certain four-dimensional theories with n equal one supersymmetry. You can compute some properties of these theories, and we will review it in the next couple of slides. But most of these theories do not possess at the moment no, uh, don't possess at the moment known Lagrangian description. So although you can predict that some theory should exist, you cannot engineer them directly in four dimensions. And they have this, sometimes they're called non-Lagrangian theories. 
There are some examples listed here where we do have Lagrangians. So one of these examples is this theory I call the zero time uh, uh, comma A1, where first group uh, denotes the singularity on which you put M5 brains. This appeared in Ami's uh, talk. So A0 means no singularity. So you just take two M5 brains and compactify them on Riemann surface. You get these theories you build in four dimensions from tri-fundamentals of SU2. This appeared in the original work of Gaiato. And then we have some weird types of Lagrangian descriptions for other cases. For example, if you have three M5 brains, we also can have certain singular types of Lagrangians. If you take two M5 brains on Z2 singularity, we can do so something similar. This theory is the E-string theory. And for it, we also can uh, write uh, theories in four dimensions using some a little bit bizarre Lagrangian constructions of the type that we will encounter towards the end of the talk. Also, for special compactifications, like when you take a generic for the uh, six-dimensional theory and you choose your compactification data in some very particular way, some things are known. For example, if you take compactify theories on tori, we know what will happen in many examples. And for some very special cases, uh, uh, which give rise to interesting theories, such as Argyros Douglas theories, also in recent years, there is some beautiful uh, progress in understanding the Lagrangians in four dimensions. And there is also a program of just predicting uh, four dimensional theories uh, starting from the six dimensions. And this, uh, this is mainly done by Jonathan Heckman and uh, collaborators. So this is the status uh, of this field of starting from six dimensions and going down to four dimensions, more or less. Most of them don't, the, okay, at the moment. <laughs> that was not the situation one year ago, uh, two years ago. But again, still, most of the theories we which we can engineer in this way, we don't know of a Lagrangian description for them. Okay, so what is the algorithm? On the next two slides, I will tell you what is the algorithm uh, of producing four-dimensional theories starting from six dimensions. That it is very, very simple. So what can we do? So we start in six dimensions, and we start with some choice of uh, supersymmetric field theory in six dimensions, some choice of one comma zero theory. And that uh, theory is uh, denoted here by T. So we take the theory and we put it on a compact space, on compact surface, on a Riemann surface, which I will denote by C. The 6D theory might have some global symmetries, and we can turn on some classical configurations for this global symmetry. For example, we can turn on some fluxes supported on the Riemann surface for uh, the theory. So for each, each of these uh, three choices, we get a different four-dimensional theory. So we have a, a, a machine which can produce a lot of different four-dimensional theories, and we can deduce some of the properties of the four-dimensional theories. For example, we know what the symmetries of the, uh, the four-dimensional theories are. These symmetries are determined by the choice of the theory in six dimensions and also by these fluxes. These fluxes might explicitly break some of the symmetry, so the symmetry will be in general a subgroup of the symmetry in six dimensions. We don't know just the symmetry, we also know the anomalies of the symmetry. So in cases where we can compute the anomaly polynomial in six dimensions, we can integrate it over the Riemann surface and obtain uh, the anomaly polynomial in four dimensions. So we know the symmetries and we know the anomalies and also we know some of the spectrum of interesting operators in four dimensions. I will not go into much detail of this, but we know in, typically, we have predictions what will be the marginal operators, what will be the exactly marginal operators of the theories in four dimensions, and what would be the relevant operators. The only thing I will mention that uh, generically we would expect uh, the four-dimensional theory when we compactify the six-dimensional theory on a genus G surface with S punctures, and the punctures we'll discuss next, we would expect the complex structure moduli of the Riemann surface these are some parameters defining the compactification to become parameters defining the 4D theories, and such continuous parameters are typically called couplings in four dimensions. So we would expect exactly marginal deformations corresponding 
to uh, this complex structure uh, moduli in four dimensions. And again, if we have some symmetries, we would expect more deformations, but this will be enough for us today. Uh, another thing, so this, the, this was the story of what we can do starting from six dimensions and going directly to four dimensions. It is useful when considering such compactifications to make a stop in five dimensions, okay? I mentioned the punctures, and the most useful way to understand punctures is to, uh, on a, uh, punctures on a Riemann surface, is to think of them as some very, very long cylinders. You take your, uh, your uh, Riemann surface, and it has a puncture, and you elongate it to very, very long cylinder, which has some radius, some small radius, and then you first compactify, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. and then you first compactify on this cylinder and get uh, a five-dimensional theory. Now the point is that for many theories that you start with in six dimensions, a circle compactification to five dimension is known in terms of gauge theories, okay, uh, of the like that Ami uh, has uh, mentioned in his talk. Not for every theory. So for a generic theory in six dimensions, we do not know what is the uh, result of compactifying on a circle, but for some theories, we know what, is, uh, such a, what such a reduction gives. And if we know what is the effective five-dimensional di description uh, in this compactification, we can study boundary conditions in this uh, compactification. And there is a very natural boundary condition, usually called the maximal boundary condition, which gives basically Dirichlet, boundary, uh, Dirichlet condition for the vector fields in five dimension and freezes them. So the gauge degrees of freedom in uh, five dimension, the gauge symmetry in five dimensions becomes a flavor symmetry associated to the puncture. So that's another thing I want you to remember, okay? So if you compactify uh, on a surface with punctures, if the theory, in, uh, if the 6D theory, when compactified on a circle to five dimensions has a gauge theory description, you can have punctures which have symmetry associated to them. And again, we can compute all the possible anomalies associated to these puncture symmetries. So this is a summary in, in, in a picture, in two pictures of what I have told you. It's a very telegraphic uh, description of the algorithm, but that's everything you will need to know for what we are going to do. So again, starting from a six-dimensional theory, you choose a surface, you choose fluxes, and then you obtain a four-dimensional theory. What, what you know about this theory is the symmetry, the anomalies, and, uh, in, uh, and some types of deformations. The symmetry typically has this form. One factor which comes from the symmetry of the 6D uh, theory and the flux. It, det it is determined by the original theory and the flux. And another type of symmetry which is associated to the punctures on the Riemann surface. So for each puncture, we have basically, well for these maximal types of punctures, we have a factor which is the gauge symmetry in five dimensions, which becomes the four-dimensional global symmetry. Okay? So this is the algorithm. So now if you give me a theory in six dimensions, we can apply this algorithm and predict existence of theories in four dimensions. We can compute their symmetries, their anomalies. Um, we can uh, predict certain duality properties because when you compactify on a Riemann surface, you can uh, construct these, th these theories uh, using different pair of pens decompositions of the Riemann surface, and all of these decompositions should be equivalent, so we can predict the dualities and so on. Okay. We, however, are interested in the reverse question, in the inverse question. All right? we, we are starting from a theory, from a very, very particular theory in four dimensions. SU3 SQCD with nine flavors. And we are asking the question, what is the theory in six dimensions which could produce this particular theory upon compactification to four dimensions? Okay. So what we will uh, do next, we will try to infer some hints from the general properties of this theory in four dimensions to understand what the five-dimensional uplift of this theory can be and what the 6D uplift of this theory can be. And, from, and uh, in this particular case, the machine, the algorithm is so restricted, it's so constrained that there will be a very natural answer that we will be able to check. And the answer will turn out to be very simple. Yes. Mm, 
in which which context? I am not aware. In this context, I'm not aware. Ah, so people consider cluster algebra in the context of quiver theories. I'm talking about more abstractly. Like there are some 4D theories. I don't even. I didn't tell you what is the Lagrangian of those theories. There are theories which correspond to different pair of pens decomposed. Like there are theories, and you can in, uh, you can uh, construct them using different pair of pens decomposition starting in six dimensions. It's just different presentation of the same theory. And because it's the di di a different presentation of the same theory, they should all be equivalent. So this is a good question. It's not, if you have a Lagrangian, you can analyze, and ex this is related to the, to, to the question we are trying to answer, and I, I, we will ma mention what we are going to do uh, for our particular example. Again, the equi one of the two questions which we pose, what is the duality group acting on the, uh, on the conformal manifold? We are going to answer that question. What pr how precisely the duality acts will remain an open question, as you will see. Yes. Yes. Right. So you need to. We want to do it preserving n equal one supersymmetry, and that you can do uh, by giving uh, by turning on flux for any abelian subgroups of G, and uh, anything you want of that type. But so there will be a parameter space itself. Right? Yes, there will be. The fluxes should be properly quantized. So there will be a discrete set of infinite discrete set of choices you are making. Each such choice will give rise to a different theory in four dimensions. So there is a huge class of theories in four dimensions that you can engineer in this way. You mean continuous parallel? Oh, sure. So f there are th I, I'm not giving too, m too many details, but the, the choices you can make are fluxes and holonomies, for example. So fluxes will, will correspond to discrete parameters. They will give different theories. And holonomies will parameterize, this par will parameterize parts of the conformal manifolds of these theories. So each such theory, will, which will come with a conformal manifold, part of it is parameterized by the complex structure moduli. Part is parameterized by this, uh, by this holonomy. So this is the general picture. Yeah, this will not play a role in what uh, we will discuss now. That's why I'm not getting into it. Okay, more questions? Okay, so this is our plan to take this algorithm and go with it in reverse, starting from four dimensions and trying to build up to six dimensions. Okay, so what are our, uh, wha what is our theory, uh, what is our starting point? So our starting point is again the SU3 SQCD with nine flavors. So using the algorithm that we have discussed, what does it teach us about a possible 6D uplift? So first of all, we are gauging an SU3 symmetry. So we think of this theory as, for example, these tri-fundamentals glued or glued together by gauging an SU3 symmetry. So what we expect is that we will have punctures which uh, have SU3 symmetry associated to them. In particular, this implies that whatever 6D theory we start with, when we compactify it on a circle, that theory will have an SU3 gauge theory description. Okay? So this, this is one naive guess that we can make that the 6D theory compactified on a circle will be a SU3 gauge theory. Uh, another uh, hint that we get from four dimensions, if you take these tri-fundamentals and uh, glue them together, so let me draw them like this. So these are tri-fundamentals of SU3. And now if you glue such tri-fundamentals together by gauging uh, SU3 symmetries, uh, say like this, and uh, I, I don't know what, you can uh, build anything you want. Typically, you can convince yourself that there you will have no global symmetry, which is not associated to these SU3 factors you started with. Okay? So we have this, uh, the original theory has these SU3s. There might be some other symmetries. For example, in the theory we have considered in the beginning, there is a baryonic symmetry. But typically, all such symmetries will be broken on the conformal manifold or broken by anomalies when you gauge things. Okay? So another hint that we uh, take from this 
is that not only this, the, gauge, the gauge theory description in 5D is in terms of SU3 gauge theory, also the theory that we get should have no symmetries. Okay? There are other ways to break symmetries once you are in four dimensions, but it is the most natural guess. Okay? The most natural guess than we, than we get from this picture is that we are after higher dimensional theories which have effective description in five dimensions and it's an SU3 gauge theory and they have no global symmetries at all. Yes. Oh, there are always there is always a possibility of accidental symmetries, and you cannot see it because this happens for very specific theories. That's why I'm in emphasizing: take a generic, take these tri fundamentals and glue them together in most generic way possible. You will not get any symmetries. Of course, if you do it in non-generic way, you will get in in some cases some symmetries. These are not explained by this picture, by this algorithm. Okay? Okay, so these are the hints. And again, this is related to the fact uh, that I ignore these fluxes here. We, we, will ex we will try to build a theory which has no flavor symmetry in six dimensions, so fluxes will not play a role in what, uh, in what I will be talking about. And also, this is the reason why we will be successful in reconstructing the theory in six dimensions, because we don't have symmetry. If we have symmetry, it, in, it introduces too much moving parts. And in, in general, we will not be able to, um, to reverse engineer this algorithm. But because here we don't have symmetries, it will be possible. Okay, so let us take these hints one dimension up uh, to five dimensions. So again, we expect an SU3 gauge theory in five dimensions, but this theory shouldn't have any symmetry. So what type of theory it can be? So we can add matter to this theory, but if we add matter to this theory, we will typically have some flavor symmetry. Okay? If we add hypermultiplets in five dimensions, we will have some flavor symmetry. But we want a theory which does not have a flavor symmetry. So a natural guess is then that the theory in five dimensions should be just pure SU3 gauge theory. Okay? A pure SU3 gauge theory comes with a choice and Ami mentioned it again in his talk, we can turn on a Chern-Simons level for this theory. So in recent years, people attempted to classify five-dimensional theories, especially theories which are simple like this, pure gauge theories with Chern-Simons levels, and the statement or the conjectures that are around are of the following type. If you take the Chern-Simons level to be small enough, these gauge theories in five dimensions, which are IR-free, they have a UV completion directly in five dimensions. Okay? So they, they are deformations of some CFT in five dimensions. If you increase the Chern-Simons level too much, at the moment we cannot make sense of these theories in five dimensions. And interestingly enough, for a particular level, for level nine, there is a very recent prediction uh, or conjecture in this paper which states that this theory doesn't have a UV completion in 5D, but it might have a UV completion in 6D. And interestingly enough, if you compute the anomalies of the puncture symmetries exactly for this theory with level 9, you reproduce the anomalies of the 4D theory. The 4D theory, remember, it's just SU3 with 9 flavors, so every SU3 flavor symmetry has 9 um, uh, nine fields, nine, free, uh, nine fields with R charge three halves. Uh, sorry, R charge two thirds. Very important. Okay, so it has a free uh, a free R charge. So with this particular level, these are the anomalies which are reproduced, and these two observations sit together together well. So on one hand, we have a prediction that with this particular level, we will have a, a UV completion in six dimensions. On the other hand the anomalies that we get in four dimensions are reproduced. Okay? So this is a very, very concrete prediction now. We expect the, theory that we get, the theories that we get in four dimensions to be related to pure SU3 gauge theories with level uh, nine Chern-Simons term in five dimensions. Now we go one dimension farther to six dimensions. So now we ask, okay, what is the six dimensional theory 
uh, that we compactify on a circle and get a 5D description in terms of level 9 SU3 gauge theory. And again, in the, in, the paper set, in the paper that I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, the conjecture is that the theory uh, you take in, uh, in six dimensions is described on its tensor branch by pure glue SU3 theory, just SU3 gauge theory with a tensor multiplier. You do whatever you need to do to cancel anomalies, but the main part is this SU3 uh, gauge multiplier. And this pure uh, T, pure glue theory, was discussed by Cyberg in mid-90s and by Bershatsky and Waffa, and they have shown that it, is, it seems to be a consistent theory, and it might have a UV completion in six dimension as a CFT. This theory is a gauge theory, pure gauge theory, so it has no, uh, no continuous symmetries. However, it has some discrete symmetries. In particular, it has a complex, it has this outer automorphism of the Dinkin diagram, the complex conjugation Z2 symmetry. And actually, the statement about the reduction to 5D is not statement of direct reduction of this SU3 gauge theory. There are many SU3s here, and actually, it's very confusing. Uh, it seems that everything is, is SU3. We started with SU3 in four dimensions. We had in, it in five, and we have it in six. This is completely, well, the 5D and 4D are related, but this SU3 is completely unrelated to 5D, as we will see soon. But the, the, SU, the SU3 effective description that you get on a circle is of the compactification of the 6D theory where you twist on a circle with this Z2 symmetry. It's very important. Okay? You take the twisted compactification of the 6D theory on a circle, and the conjecture is that you get the uh, 5D theory that we mentioned on the previous slide. It is not known what is the untwisted uh, compactification. So this is the theory then which we conjecture is relevant for our compactification. If we start from this particular theory, we do these twist compactifications, and we go to four dimensions, we should get uh, theories which are similar to SU3 with nine flavors. Okay? And this is the statement which we will now try to check. Before that, if we are already in six dimensions, let us just discuss what, what we can do with pure gauge theory. So the theory we obtained, in, which is relevant for us, is pure SU3 gauge theory. So let us ask what other pure gauge theories, pure glue gauge theories, you can consider in six dimensions. And the list is very, very small. Okay, these are all theories which you can consider. SU3. About SU3. Good, it has Witten anomaly. SU2 and G2 are okay, so let me just mention, why is this, the, the list is so short? The list is so short because you cannot cancel these types of anomalies. They don't exist for this, t for this, uh, for SU3, F4, E6, E7, and E8. It does exist for SO8, but you can show that actually the anomaly is zero just by computing it. And uh, for SU2 and G2, this anomaly also doesn't exist, but pi six of these groups is not trivial, and then uh, you have Witten types of anomalies. So this is a very, very short list of theories you can consider. And it was discussed by Cyberg. I think the Witten anomalies was discussed by, uh, by Waffa and Bershatsky in, uh, in mid-90s. So the list is very short. We can, we, what is relevant for us is this SU3, but the moment we are in six dimensions and we know that these theories are interesting, we might as well consider the other theories too. Okay? And we'll have something to say about SO8 in the end. Okay, so the moment we know these theories in six dimensions, uh, uh, but at the moment we have some technology to compute their anomalies. All of these theories don't have global symmetries, no, no continuous global symmetries. They only have R symmetries, and we can compute the anomaly polynomial in six dimensions. We can integrate it of, on the Riemann surface as we discussed. And here are, for example, predictions, very generic predictions for 4D conformal anomalies that you should get by compactifying these theories on a genus G Riemann surface. Okay? If I want to introduce punctures, I would need to tell you what is the effective description in five dimensions, but without punctures, we don't need five dimensions. So this is, this, these are the predictions, and DG and lambda G are some group theoretical numbers uh, which you can compute, which are listed here. Okay? So in, you can predict these anomalies. What are the 4D theories is an open question, and we will solve this question for the case of SU3, and I also tell you what the answer is for SO8. Is the number of star size uh, the four dimensional theory? Or 
No, this, 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 this is the gauge group of the 6D theorem, okay? And these numbers are just, this is just the dimension of the group, and lambda G is related to, you compute trace F to the 4 in the adjoint representation and ask how it is related to trace F squared squared, and there is some relative coefficient, which, uh, which is this lambda G. So these are numbers, these are just group theory numbers param parameterizing these groups in six dimensions. Okay, so now that we have this, uh, this six-dimensional starting point, so again, what is the logic? We started from four dimensions, we deduced some hints about what is the possible lift to six dimensions, and now we have a very concrete conjecture. What is the starting point in six dimensions, which should reproduce theories of, of the sort we, we considered in the beginning? And it is this pure SU3 theory in six dimensions. So we can just forget everything that we've done before and just apply the algorithm of going from 6 to 4 with this particular 1,0 theory. Okay? So we con can compute anomalies. In this particular case of SU3, we know what the 5D description is, so we can compute anomalies with punctures, and this is the result of computation. Yes? Yes, so in this particular case, it's, it's actually rather simple. So the technology which was developed mainly by Yuji Tachikawa and his collaborators is very simple. You just go on the tensor branch and compute the anomaly on the tensor branch. So you just take the contribution of the vector fields, of the tensor, of the Green-Schwartz term, and uh, sum everything together, and you get the eight-form anomaly polynomial. Now, this, was, this procedure was checked in different ways with other more sophisticated uh, computations that one can perform, and it don't always gives the right uh, answer. Sorry, are you talking about the punctures? Oh, the punctures is, is, is in a sense a little bit uh, simpler. So you just go to five, uh, to five dimensions, and for example, uh, you, you just compute uh, what would be, what are the, uh, let me give one example. So the, there is the, the you have these chern simons terms, which uh, in, in five dimensions. So you have a gauge theory with a chern simons term, and you just compute the anomaly inflow argument about this, you know, the what, what would be an anomaly inflow induced by this, um, uh, by this chern simons term to four dimensions for this SUN global symmetry that you have now in five dimensions and compute it. That, is th that computation is rather standard, but this computation of uh, in anomaly polynomial in 6D is a more, s like it's, a by now we believe it because it works, but it's, it's, it's more modern uh, uh, result than, uh, uh, than, uh, than other things. Okay, so we can compute these anomalies. And now the question is, what are the theories in four dimensions which would produce these anomalies? So in general, like in these cases, we will be without any clue, okay, for general groups, F4, E6, E7, and so on. We don't know what these theories would be, and like in class S. But in this particular case, we started with some theories which we thought should be related to these uh, compactifications, and now we have a clue. So the clue is that what needs to play a role are these tri-fundamental, uh, tri-fundamentals. And here I write these tri-fundamentals as, uh, so the squares are SU3 flavor symmetries, uh, the circles are SU3 gauge symmetries. So these tri-fundamentals, I write them as a triplet of bifundamentals of SU3, just to write a nice quiver. So the statement is, very concrete statement is, if you take a quiver built from three such tri-fundamentals, where you gauge two SU3 symmetries in this way and turn a baryonic superpotential for the middle, uh, for the uh, chiral fields appearing here in the middle, then you get four SU3 symmetries. So one SU3, another SU3, another SU3 rotating this triplet of chirals and uh, another SU3 rotating this triplet of chirals. You compute the anomalies of this theory and they exactly match the predictions from six dimensions for a sphere with four punctures, okay? And all the other anomalies match too, also anomalies of uh, punct puncture symmetries and mixed anomalies of puncture symmetries with R symmetries, okay? So this is the conjectural concrete relation between six dimensions and four dimensions. This is the theory, not the theory that Zor asked about, okay? So this is... Con 
What do you mean punctured data? Uh, we will get to it. At the moment, we are just talking about maximum puncture. So the, there are these boundary conditions in 5D where you give um, Dirichlet boundary conditions to all the vector fields, and these are typically called maximal punctures. So these types of punctures we talk about, uh, on, in a couple of slides we'll discuss other punctures. But this is the puncture. There are not too many punctures in this case. Okay, so this is a conjecture. So this is a four-punctured sphere. So I, I draw it again here in this language. So it's just two tri-fundamentals. It's uh, three tri-fundamentals. One of them I write with these wiggly lines, meaning that I turn on a baryonic superpotential which breaks the SU3 rotating the, uh, the triplets of chiral field. So there are two building blocks. There are these tri-fundamentals and these tri-fundamentals. The difference is that here there is some superpotential turned on. So I take three such tri fundamentals, glue them together, and obtain a four punctured sphere. That's what appeared on the previous slide. But now from four punctured spheres, we can build arbitrary Riemann surfaces with even numbers of punctures. Okay? So and here is an example of genus three Riemann surface that you can build. And you check, uh, can check anomalies. Everything, everything matches with uh, predictions from six dimensions. There is no non-Lagrangian part. This is a completely Lagrangian construction. Okay. Okay. You, will, you will get a little bit of non-Lagrangian stuff towards the end. But this construction is completely Lagrangian. Okay. Now, what you can ask is, I, I, I told you what is the theory corresponding to four punctured sphere, and from it you can build any theory with even number of punctures. What happens with odd number of punctures? Okay. Is there a three punctured sphere? And the answer is that we do not know. And why we do not know? And we do not know because of this Z2 twist. Okay? We only know the 5D reduction if we twist by this Z2 symmetry. Okay? And then we get a 5D description with gauge theory and we know what a puncture is. So we only know what punctures are with Z2 twists. And with Z2 twists, we only can have consistently even number of punctures on a sphere. So the answer is there are probably three puncture spheres, but then you need to have an untwisted puncture and we just do not know what it is. Another uh, piece of information uh, or another uh, thing which comes, uh, uh, w which goes into the same direction is the following statement. If you consider the four punctured, uh, the four punctured sphere depicted here, it has some huge con conformal manifold. Uh, you can ask what is the direction on this conformal manifold corresponding to complex structure modulus of the four puncture sphere, which is one dimension. There is one complex structure modulus. And the statement is that uh, the statement we want to make is that on this large conformal manifold, the direction which com corresponds to complex structure modulus does not pass f through the free point. Okay? These, uh, these are, again, uh, theories with conformal manifolds which do pass through the free point, but the, con the, the complex structure modulus should not pass through the free point. And then if you want to decompose the four-puncture sphere into three-puncture spheres, you can do it by going to some cusps on this uh, sub-manifold of the conformal manifold, but then the description will be strongly coupled. We don't have a description of this decomposition in terms of weakly gauging of anything. So we do not know, even in this way, of the composition, what are the three punctured spheres? So we can only produce four punctured spheres. Another thing uh, we can do is to check conformal manifolds, and that you can do by computing the supersymmetric index. Supersymmetric index uh, um, encodes very neatly uh, the marginal deformations and relevant uh, deformations. So index is some expansion in fugacities. And for low powers of these fugacities, which are typically called QP, uh, the only things which contribute to the index are relevant operators, and here there are no such contributions, so these theories have no relevant deformations. At order QP of expansion of the index, what you get is the contribution of marginal operators minus the currents, and you neatly see this 3G minus 3 plus S, the complex structure uh, moduli of the Riemann surface is appearing. The minus 8 are the conserved currents corresponding to the different punctures, to the SU3 symmetries corresponding to punctures, and then you get additional marginal operators charged under puncture symmetry. So if you turn them on, you break 
puncture symmetry. So you usually don't count those deformations. So there are no relevant deformations simply because it's very chiral. The theory is very chiral. So this is a 4D theory. It doesn't have any relevant deformation. So this, sorry? Yes, we didn't get to it yet. But a generic theory will be, you know, something like that. It will be long. Why SU3 with nine flavors has it? Because it's, it has only one gauge node. It's very short quiver. So it's a non-generic situation where you have relevant operators. For generic compactification, you will not have marginal operators. You just, these are just f fields in the fundamental all the time of, like, of, of this group. You just cannot f build anything which is relevant. That's a good question. Okay, so we get the right dimension of the conformal manifold. Now, another thing which we can do, which is related to Ami's question, we can ask what are the other punctures of this theory? So a, a, a useful way to generate new punctures is to close punctures. To close punctures means to give vacuum expectation values uh, to operators which are charged under uh, puncture symmetry. And we have here these marginal operators in the 10 of SU3 to which we can give vacuum expectation values. Now, because here we have these twists around the punctures, we cannot completely close the puncture. What this procedure will produce, it will produce a puncture which has no symmetry, but it is still a puncture. Okay? It's kind of an empty puncture. And analogous things exist in class S, if you know about that. So with these uh, new punctures, we again can compute the index, and again it is consistent with... Uh, uh, with the uh, conformal manifold being uh, the dimension of uh, the complex structure moduli. Another cute observation that you can make by studying these empty punctures is that triplets of empty punctures are equivalent to full punctures. So triplets of empty punctures contribute both to anomalies and to conformal manifold as uh, a single maximal puncture. Okay? So the statement here is that you have a huge conformal manifold so you, you consider a theory which corresponds to compactification of on a surface with only empty punctures with no symmetries. And then you go to some cusps where triplets of uh, empty punctures collide. And so these are some sub-manifolds of the full manifold. And then this theory is equivalent to a theory with uh, three less empty punctures but on the same, uh, on the same surface. Okay, so this is a weird statement, which again has analogs in other compactifications. Now, why I bothered uh, to t tell you about uh, closing punctures, it seems uh, a more sophisticated procedure to do, but that's how we can answer now Zor's question. Okay, so now we want to find the SU3 with nine flavors in our construction. So... I will, uh, I will mention the question in a moment. Okay, so uh, wha what we want to do is to generate theory which is SU3 with nine flavors. And we can do so by just giving VEVs to some operators. Giving VEVs to some operators will Higgs the gauge symmetry. For example, giving VEV to this operator, to some baryonic operator built from these chiral fields will Higgs this symmetry and we will just obtain SU3 with nine flavors. And uh, the questions we are asking are about these theories, and the questions are, is there a geometric picture okay, in which this theory lives? And the second, more interesting question, what is the duality group acting on the conformal manifold of this theory, on the seven-dimensional manifold of this theory? So to engineer SU3 with nine flavors, we simply start from four punctured sphere and close one of the punctures to an empty puncture. So this theory, which is SU3 with nine flavors with a particular superpotential, is just a theory with three maximal punctures and one empty puncture. But with this picture, where maximal puncture is equivalent to three empty punctures, this is also the same as a sphere with ten empty punctures. Okay? And, uh, and again, you should think of theory with maximal punctures as living on sub loci of this uh, big manifold. So the answer to Zor's question is that his theory, SU3 with nine flavors, or rather Lee Strassler theory, is uh, obtained by compactifying SU pure SU3 gauge theory on a sphere 
with 10 empty puncture, 10 empty twisted punctures. The conformal manifold of this theory just compute 3G minus 3 plus S. S is 10, G is 0. We have minus 3, so we get seven-dimensional conformal manifold, as, ex as one can verify by direct computation in four dimension. So what we expect the duality group to be, it should be the mapping class group of a sphere with 10 punctures. Okay? That's the answer. No, I didn't. Uh, this is completely Lagrangian, completely, from beginning to the end, everything Lagrangian. Exactly, everything Lagrangian. Okay, so now in the remaining five minutes or so, I will uh, just uh, briefly show the answer for the SO8 theory. So we can start in six dimensions from SO8. And we can just uh, try to do the same thing. The nice thing about SO8 is that SO8 is, uh, is another example uh, in addition to SU3 where we know, or at least we have a conjecture, what a compactification on a circle is. Okay? And SO8 has, uh, has this uh, S3 uh, outer automorphism uh, of the Dinkin, uh, Dinkin diagram, which, uh, which has this Z3 triality subgroup. And we can twist by this Z3 when we go to five dimensions. And the statement is that this twisted compactification is given by pure SU3, uh, sorry, SU4 gauge theory in five dimensions with Chern Simons level eight. Okay, this is a conjecture. So you see here it's SO8 goes to SU4. So the SU3 goes to SU3 of the previous example was, uh, was a, a coincidence. Maybe we should take it seriously, but it's a coincidence. Okay, so we have this uh, effective 5D description, so we can compute, so compute all the anomalies and, uh, and we know what the puncture symmetry is in this case, it's SU4. We know what the anomalies are and we can try to guess what the, fi uh, what the field theories in four dimensions are. Now Ami will be satisfied with some non-Lagrangian stuff. So when you, you, you go to four dimensions, you figure out that the anomalies of the, of the symmetry corresponding to the puncture uh, are reproduced if you take eight fundamentals of SU4. Okay? This is an experimental fact. And then it is uh, eight, uh, eight fundamentals of SU4 and importantly with R charge half, not a free R charge. And then it is natural to, ga to glue such things together by, gauging, by, by combining this eight fundamentals of SU4 into two by fundamentals of SU4 and gauging the SU4s. Then the gauging is exactly requires this R charge to be a half. Okay? And then the, the conjecture is that this quiver theory, again, uh, with a baryonic superpotential in the middle, corresponds to a three punctured sphere. Okay? We have an SU4 symmetry here, an SU4 symmetry here, and two SU2 symmetries. So it's SU4 times SU4 times SU2 squared. So it doesn't look the right answer, but the statement is, or the conjecture is, that the two SU2 factors somewhere on the conformal manifold of this, sim, uh, of this theory enhance to SU4, okay? So you have this theory which is completely Lagrangian. You go to a cusp on the conformal manifold where the symmetry enhances. SU2 square enhances to SU4, and then you, can, you, get, sorry, you get this three punctured sphere, and you can start from this three punctured sphere and glue any surface together. But this is non-Lagrangian because we, we tuned to a place on the conformal manifold where uh, symmetry enhances, okay? So the, the building is almost Lagrangian. It's Lagrangian in the sense that we can compute anything supersymmetric, but it's, you cannot put it on a lattice, for example. Okay, so let me summarize uh, with some comments. So we have obtained a large class of 4D theories by compactifying SU3 theories that we discussed in a bit of detail, and then I mentioned the SO8 case. The former construction is completely Lagrangian, completely. There is nothing non-Lagrangian about it. So it is a close cousin of SU2 class S, okay? It's the same type of tri-fundamentals. Instead of doing an equal two gauging, we do an equal one gauging. So it, in a sense, it's even simpler. So it's extremely simple example, maybe one of the simplest examples of these reductions till now. The latter case, is a bit non-Lagrangian. We need to gauge symmetries that we don't see in the Lagrangian. 
And this is very similar to the Lagrangians or singular Lagrangians wh which we can find for other examples. Okay? So it seems like a general feature, gauging symmetries which don't appear at weak coupling but appear in strong coupling to construct Lagrangian and it sh we should understand it better. Again, I, I stress that the possible or reverse reduction here was possible because we didn't have symmetries. Having no symmetries was constraining enough so that this algorithm from 6D to 4D could be reverse engineered. Okay, with symmetries, there are too many uh, moving parts that we can play with and it becomes hard. So there are many open questions. So one is understanding all pure glue gauge theories in six dimensions, their compactifications compactifications with no twists. Now we know what the duality group is, or we can conjecture what a duality group is in many cases, but how these duality groups acts on the couplings? Can we somehow understand it? How this uh, huge duality acts on the seven uh, dimensional conformal manifold? Can we understand it, this question in some useful way? And please, if you have other uh, interesting uh, coincidences, uh, tell me about them. I we can try to play and build the theories in six dimensions. And you should have asked me about uh, the first lesson of Schwartz. So I end with the first lesson of Schwartz. If a theory developed for purpose A turns out to be better suited for purpose B, modify your goal accordingly. So till now I didn't need to use this, but maybe the time is not ripe yet. Okay, thank you. Has what? Yes, it's is there any indicator of Not that I know of. It's it's an interesting question. I, I don't know. So the the, the the dual description will be an SU six uh, gauge theory. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know how to use it. One thing that I need to mention so I mentioned this uh, the fact that there is uh, a known reduction uh, Oh, let me start from another point of view. In 5D, there is a conjecture that pure SU3 with some level, level 9, lifts to 6D. SU4 with level 8 lifts to 6D. And there is another less, much less established conjecture, I'm even not sure it was published, that SU6 with level 9 lifts to, uh, to 6 dimension. So it might be related to, to, uh, to SU3 in some uh, complicated way, or it might be just lifting to some other uh, six-dimensional theory, or it might be just wrong. We, we couldn't make sense of the SU6, so we tried, but... Uh, what, what do you know about the other theory? Uh, the nothing. <laughs> nothing. So, the, uh, very naive, you know, we have two data points, so we can extrapolate. So, the, the naive guess would be that you need to twist in order to get a gauge theory. We don't understand why. So that happens for SU3, that happens for SO8. You can do, S E6 so has also an outer automorphism, so maybe E6 can be done. So the conjecture what? That this SU6 should be somehow related to E6 compactifications. We couldn't make it work. And basically it is not known. So 